The reading is Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 11. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our Lord, to comfort all those who mourn and provide those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. There will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord, for the display of his splendour. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Aliens will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work in your field and vineyards. And you will be priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion and instead of disgrace. They will rejoice their inheritance so that they will inherit a double portion in the land and everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the people who see them will acknowledge them that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a rope of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels, for as the soil makes the young plant come up and the garden causes the seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. This is the word of the Lord. I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just over um, a week ago, I was standing on a chair over there, putting up a poster, the wonky one. <laughs> Just before I got on the chair, the phone rang. And so, I haven't got my phone with me, but I, I, so I, was, I got onto the chair and I was like this, and I'm putting the poster up, talking on the phone. And I'm still talking on the phone. I've finished putting the poster up and I stepped off the chair. Well, I, must have, I think I must have had it in my hand by then, but I stepped off the chair. I'm not sure what happened, but instead of gracefully stepping down, I fell off. And I landed straight hard on my backside. And Jeanette and Derek came rushing in because I'd made such a clatter. And I was flat on the floor with my, hand, my, my phone still in my hand, <laughs> still talking to the person. I banged my head as well, so I mean, it was a bit of a... <laughs> it's funny now. <laughs> it hurt at the time. So I'm just wondering, is that justice? Justice for not following health and safety regulations? I'm sorry, Tim. <laughs> it's not in the book. <laughs> Justice is one of those things that we all want, isn't it? The problem is we don't agree on what justice is. And we don't agree on what justice is. Because we, so, and because we don't agree on what justice is, we don't agree on how society should work. Because the two are inextricably linked. We talk a lot about um, justice, economic justice, criminal justice, balancing the scales of justice, justice in football matches. 
And um, parents and teachers and, and students talk a lot about justice. They probably don't call it justice, but they do talk a lot about it. So is justice about equality, fairness, getting what we deserve, getting what we need? I think when we talk about justice, there are two things we talk about. Stuff and punishment. When we talk about stuff, it's who's got more stuff? And the stuff might be money or food or access to services. We're aware that not everyone has the same. So should we base justice on equality? The assumption that everyone should benefit from the same support. But our needs aren't all the same. So, should we base justice on needs? Everyone should get the support that they need. Should we base justice on fairness? Political philosopher John Rawls said, any inequalities that exist in a social system should favour the least well-off because this levels the playing field of society. But is that fair? What if we base justice on removing the cause of the imbalance so that no one needs to change their behaviour? Is that justice? Or is that giving in to human demands of entitlement? So that's justice in terms of stuff. Sorry, it's a little bit of a lesson before we get going. <laughs> what about justice in terms of punishment? Firstly, there's retributive um, justice. The wrongdoer must suffer in proportion to how the victim suffered. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Corporal punishment, the death penalty. Then there's rehabilitative, can't say that quickly, rehabilitative justice, twice in one row. <laughs> the thought that it is no good causing pain to wrongdoers. Some other form of punishment or rehabilitation will help them to follow society's rules. Throw them into prison, for instance. Are people rehabilitated after a stretch in prison? Or deterrent justice. The punishment should send a message to other wrongdoers to stop them doing wrong. So something like the speed awareness course, for instance. Does it work? It worked for me, falling off a chair, because it still hurts. And, um, and I don't want to stand on a chair again. So it's taught me a lesson. And lastly, restorative justice, making amends for what you've done, for example, by doing community service. Is that justice? Justice is a complicated subject. Verse 8 in today's passage from Isaiah says, I, the Lord, love justice. God cares passionately about issues of poverty and justice. Concern for the poor and emphasis on justice flows throughout the Bible. I've got a Bible um, called the um, um, <laughs> Poverty and Justice Bible. The one that Martin's got. <laughs> Um, and inside, it has all the verses highlighted for, um, that, are, that are to do with justice and poverty. And probably more than half of the Bible is um, highlighted. There's over 3,000 verses that are, are highlighted. The Bible underpins, or justice underpins, the law of the Old Testament. God's laws throughout the Old Testament made provision for the marginalised. There were laws of gleaning, where landowners had to leave the edges of their fields unharvested to ensure that the poor could gather what was left. And for the aliens, or the, the foreigners. There were laws covering the care of widows and orphans, giving food to the hungry and clothes to the naked. And there was the law of jubilee, the year of the Lord's favour. Every 50th year was a chance to start again. All debts were released. Wouldn't that be great if we still did that? 
all debts were released. So no matter how deeply you were in debt, you could start again. That was part of God's law. Justice is in the words of the prophecies. More than half of Isaiah 61, which we read um, just now, is about poverty and justice. Justice is a core part of Jesus' teaching, and it's central to the rest of the New Testament writings. Now, some of the Old Testament justice seems a little bit harsh to us nowadays. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But it does show God's intolerance for wrongdoing. And in the light of the New Testament, it explains why Jesus had to die for us. God is just. He understands how power can corrupt. God laid aside his privilege and his power and identified with the weak and helpless. He endured violence and human injustice to pay the penalty for our injustice and our wrongdoings. God's justice punishes evildoing and it restores victims of injustice. God's favour isn't favouritism, it's justice. God loves justice. But verse 8 actually begins with the word for, for I the Lord love justice. And that means that everything up to verse 8 is about justice. And that's our theme for today, in case you hadn't already guessed it. (laughs) I preached on this passage last December, (laughs) a year later, and I can't remember that I'd ever written, I'd ever um, preached on it. Then, but then I wrote about it being God's manifesto, God's intentions for His people. We know that a political party's manifesto is not necessarily what they're going to do. In fact, most of the promises made during a political campaign will never come to pass. They're just a ruse to get people to vote for them. God is different. He is truth. He cannot lie. What he says will happen. It will happen because he says so, and he is truth. God abides by his own standards, which is more than our politicians do thinking about the current Christmas party debacle. God's justice is based on his character. It's based on a moral absolute. And that is something human beings have lost sight of. If we have no moral absolute, who wins? The feminist or the transgender person? If we have no moral absolute, then there could be an argument for exploiting the poor. They're the minority. So it's more cost-effective to exploit them. So oppression and unequal powers creep in. If we have no moral absolute, then individual freedom trumps family and community values. The more we demand our individual freedom, justice for ourselves, the more we see family breakdowns, neighbourhoods at loggerheads, and institutional breakdowns and if we have no moral absolute then we can do anything that makes us happy as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else but that hurting anybody else is subjective power can creep in again African Americans were told that they were segregated for their own good the majority determined what was not harmful, yet it was harmful. Through this lens, our justice system doesn't work, does it? Human justice can never be as complete as God's justice because we can only see things from a human point of view. God always sees the whole. If we look more carefully into these verses, we can see more of the heart of God. So let's look at them in order. Verses 1 to 3 tell us that things will not go on as they are forever. 
a new time is coming, a time of God's favour, but also a time of God's judgment. Isaiah 61 focuses on the time of favour and on the one who will bring it. We know that the year of the Lord's favour will be brought in by the coming of the Messiah. It has been brought in by the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. The anointed one that is coming will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And 2 Corinthians 3.17 tells us, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And from the Gospels, we see how Jesus fulfilled these words and brought freedom. Matthew 11.5 tells us, The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. It's the marginalized who are receiving, the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the prisoners, the mourners. And they're receiving good news, healing, freedom, release from darkness, comfort and joy. And when they have been transformed, when they've been freed, they will be called oaks of righteousness. It's the poor, the unbound, the released, the comforted who will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for his display, for, sorry, for the display of his splendor. It's the marginalized who will be given a new status, a new name, new powers and new responsibilities. We've all been marginalized at some point in our lives. And God has freed us to serve him. So it is they who will rebuild ancient ruins, restore the places long devastated, and it's them who will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Because of what the Messiah is going to do, it will be the poor and oppressed who will do the restoring Isaiah's prophecy was beginning to be fulfilled as the city of Jerusalem was rebuilt by Nehemiah, which we did last year. But the fulfillment in Jesus is much, much greater. It is those who are healed and freed and released and comforted by Jesus and rooted in Jesus who will be fully empowered, who will have the vision and energy through through the proclaiming of the gospel and the work of the Spirit to grow the church. I believe that it is those outside of the church at this moment who will be at the forefront of building the church. We were praying on Wednesday for the bus stop cafe and there was a real sense that those who come in will become the, servant, the servers. When God saves... He restores, he transforms, and he calls. Look what Jesus did with his disciples. Jesus' mission strategy was purely to disciple his disciples, to teach them what he was doing, to encourage them to do it, and then let them loose. What God commands us to do, he enables us to do by the power of God of the Holy Spirit. And God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. I'm sure you've heard that before. He doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. So if you feel that you've got no gifts, step out. If you have said yes to Jesus, then you are anointed and you will be equipped. But you have to step out of your comfort zone. Oaks of righteousness are a similar picture to the vine which Jesus talks about in John's Gospel. Jesus speaks about remaining in the vine in order to be fed so that we bear much fruit. John 15, 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. We show ourselves to be disciples by the fruit that we bear. We are the trees of God's delight. And when we bear that fruit, we feel God's delight. Do you feel God's delight in what you're doing? 
What fruit can you see in your life? So on to verse 5. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. This is an indication that the Gentiles will become part of God's people. Again, people from outside coming to serve with the community of God. This is not slavery. This is willing commitment. And Israel will fulfill its role among the nations. Verse 6, you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, the priests of Israel stood between God and the people. The priests brought the people's sins to God and animal sacrifices to God brought God's forgiveness. In the New Covenant, God's forgiveness came through Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus' death and resurrection tore down the barrier between us and God. Old Covenant priests are no longer required. All of us are priests. All believers are priests. Jesus has settled all accounts. And Peter affirms this in his letter, 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So now all believers can read God's word. All believers can confess sins to God directly. All believers can talk to God directly. And all believers can minister to one another. And verse 7 goes on to say, Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land. And everlasting joy will be yours. The old relationship of Jerusalem and the nations will be radically changed. Israel will be doubly blessed. And verse 8 continues. In my faithfulness... I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. Wouldn't it be good if people saw that in us? Through Jesus, our old relationship with God has been radically changed. We too are doubly blessed. God is faithful In everything, every one of his promises will be fulfilled and eventually the whole world will know. And the natural response to God's justice is praise and thanksgiving. Verse 10, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. Reminds me of the, uh, the song that Mary sang after the angel told her she was going to be pregnant with God's son. I delight greatly in the Lord. He gave her a job to do and she delighted in it. Excuse me. <coughs> God's justice through Jesus is a garment of righteousness. And Galatians 3.27 reminds us, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Jesus is our righteousness. God looks on us now as pure and unblemished. Our righteousness was bought on the cross. Our spirit of despair has been replaced by a garment of praise. The year of the Lord's favor was begun through Jesus' death and resurrection. And the year of the Lord's favour will continue until Jesus returns. But all these things that Isaiah prophesied, good news, healing, freedom, release from darkness, comfort and joy, a new name, new clothes, new blessings, are ours through Jesus, the anointed one. 
we are justified, just as if I'd never sinned because of Jesus. What is justice then? Justice is preaching good news to the meek, to the repentant and humble or poor in spirit. Justice is healed lives. Justice is release from darkness. Justice is freedom. Justice is comfort and joy. Justice is new life in a relationship with Jesus. Justice is laying aside privilege and power, just as Jesus did. Justice comes to us through Jesus. The anointed one brings real justice. And because of the anointed one, you too are anointed. How will you bring justice to those who are perishing? What privilege and power do you need to lay aside for the sake of the kingdom of God? Amen. Our um, crookhorn prayer and covenant and declaration are all based on Isaiah 61. So I thought it'd be good if we prayed that together, the prayer of declaration. So, Lord, we promise that empowered by your Holy Spirit, we will rise up in crookhorn with courage and boldness we will help bring revival to this area. We will preach your good news and bind up the brokenhearted, (coughs) proclaim freedom to the captives and release people from darkness. We will move out of our comfortable building and into our community. We will work to rebuild this area on the foundation of love, grace, mercy and truth. We will work to see Crookhorn healed and transformed and a beacon to the borough of Havant. We, the people of the Church of the Good Shepherd, will come together in unity across the generations. And we... (coughs) By the power of the name of Jesus, Lord we will bless the people of Crookhorn and in your supernatural power, we believe we will see healing, miracles and lives transformed. Lord, we are yours. Use us. Amen.